Hello, I'm absolutely delighted today to bring you Andrea Andy Simon. And I'm going to read her resume to you because it's impressive. And what I do say about somebody like Andy is if we hired her as a consultant, we probably couldn't afford her. So listen very carefully to the advice and guidance she's given today. So Andrea Simon is a corporate anthropologist, culture change expert, futurist, blue ocean strategist, speaker, podcaster, and author specializing in helping people and companies change and expanding a global mission of women's empowerment. So to Andy Simon, a very warm welcome. What a pleasure to be here, Nadia. It's truly a treat to share with you and your listeners. I'm glad you invited me. Thank you. Andy, so can we start off with a corporate anthropologist? So unpack that for us. Absolutely. So I am an anthropologist and I studied um, immigrants from Greece and return migration to Greece. I actually took my daughters when they were four and five to study Greek women. This was a long time ago. My daughters are in their mid 40s, but they were great so that we could understand both people's cultures and how they changed. And then I became a professor. And then by chance, my husband introduced me to a bunch of city bankers during deregulation. And they said, why don't you come and help us change? And I said, I don't know how, but let's do it. And that's my mantra, because they had a need, and I knew how to observe and understand people's cultures and how they change them, which is difficult because the brain hates to change. So the very thing they were trying to do was an anathema to the very people they were trying to do it to. So I spent some time as a consultant, and then I became an executive in two banks, helping them change. I will say this gently, I launched the first ATM for one bank, and I actually brought the first computer for another, and they had electric typewriters, and they thought that was perfectly fine. What was I doing to them? And then I decided that it was time. I spent another few years in healthcare, but it was time for me to launch my business after 9-11. And my, my PR firm said to me, oh, Andy, you're a corporate anthropologist that helps companies change. And I went, bingo. So he, by that sentence, gave me my elevator speech, I will tell you, this was 2002. I don't think there were five people searching for a business anthropologist or a corporate anthropologist. If search was going on then, I don't think people knew what we could do or how. And I must say part of my mission over the last 20 years is to be helping people understand how business organizations can use an anthropological mindset, the tools of the trade. And my first book, On the Brink, A Fresh Lens to Take Your Business to New Heights, was all about how seven case studies of clients of mine who were stuck or stalled, that's a, a thing that happens, and we helped them see what was all around them by taking them and making them amateur anthropologists. So the methodology offers had tools for people in business or in their own lives to step out and take some time to look at what's happening. And that's how I've positioned myself and my brand I, um, my, my organization, my agency was ranked as the top 2020 corporate anthropology agency in New York this year. And I am honored to share that because um, it is a very interesting approach to how people can change wherever they are and restart their growth. It's important to know you have to step back and see it. So that's what we do. And that's what an anthropologist does. Does that help? And yes, and what a time, Andy, to be doing this, where change has accelerated so much over the last nine months. So I know you've been in demand helping organizations rapidly change, and I like to say virtualize, right? <laughs> Take us through a process of maybe one of the case studies in On the Brink. Sure. Um, I, let's go to the, the, those reflected the traditional world that we were in. Um, but I have several clients I've been working with for several years. And the question for them was, how do we respond to the COVID pandemic and the economic transformations? One's a healthcare client, another is an accounting firm. I use those as illustrations because they're relevant and people can see it. Remember, the brain hates the unfamiliar. So start with that. The second thing is the brain has a story in it about reality. It's your reality. It's how you perceive things and you only see what conforms to it. Thank your brain for the stability. And then in a weekend, everybody had to go to be virtual. And all the clients now were trying to figure out what was the PPE and what was we going to do with it? And how were we going to really understand how our business was going to impact? Everything was changing. And now we have to begin to shift from stability and do more of the same better to adapt and be agile and nimble. 
which means that the creative juices, the risk-taking, trusting that people can be empowered to make good decisions became new values. You know, whether it's an accounting firm or healthcare, there are lots of rules. Now, how do we really understand how we build a culture of empowerment, enabling people to trust that their decisions will be okay? You cannot manage top down. You gotta change the whole leadership style. So I've got several leadership academies going on just for that reason, because how are we gonna train the leaders of tomorrow when the world now needs a different kind? So and it's the first step in this, is mm -hmm. the first step to acknowledging what you're saying is that the brain does not like change. No. We perceive change as danger. So I imagine in your work, the first step is there is change. How do we shift mindset and how do you do that? Well, remember, um, there's great research, both from the cognitive sciences and the social sciences and psychiatry. You can collaborate with your mind. You don't realize it. That's such a good term. You can collaborate with your own mind. Well, you That's actually can. <laughs> well, actually, I borrowed it. <laughs> but the, the, the thing that you must understand is that your brain does exactly what it thinks you want it to do. So if you are thinking that this is bad and all the change is awful, then your brain will say this is bad and this is awful. It will only see the things that conform to your sense of bad and awful. But if you collaborate with your mind and say, this is a new opportunity. I've had some clients who said, my gosh, I've been able to do things that I've never been able to do. I said, don't waste a crisis. It gives you freedom to try things. But when you collaborate with your mind and you shift your focus and you begin to tell it what you really would like it to be, you begin to imagine it. It begins to believe that that's true. I know it sounds bizarre, but once it becomes a believer of the things that you want to do, it begins to see all the things that affirm it and conform to it. And you now have a new reality, the new story. And don't underestimate, you live your story. You think you don't, but it becomes who you are. Okay, and so we so can- do a I think this is a perfect time to do a quick uh, survey with the people who are watching or listening to us, which is on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your current collaboration with your own brain, <laughs> right, Andy? So 10 being, you're telling yourself change is good, things are fine, that's a 10. One being you are totally paralyzed. Yep. So that's interesting. So for you personally right now, your business has exploded over this period. So your collaboration with your brain, Andy Simons, because of the muscle that you've created is a 10. It's a 10 and a half because we've had a great year. And between the new book coming out, the new program we're developing, the new clients, the executive coaching we're doing, um, our, our value now is to help people deal with things that they have always hated to do and didn't know how. And so I feel like we are a sports coach. You know, nobody knows how to play cricket, but we all have to play cricket. Well, it's a game. And I often use that as a metaphor. I say, if Robert Redford can play many different roles, so can you. How does he do it? Why can't you? And they go, oh, I said, well, life's a stage. And if you get a metaphor like that, it's not so scary. And of course I can learn a new script. So if you are coaching an executive, your first thing or an executive or a team is to look at their relationship to self and their relationship with dealing with change. And that sounds obvious, but the way you've expressed that is brilliant. Well, you know, part of what we do is we listen to their stories. And we also have them listen to them. So if you tape record your story about who you are and what you're doing and, and begin to listen back to it, you begin to hear the things that you value and what you want to do more of and the things that you really don't value today and you really want to stop. The most interesting part about change is you can do it. If you begin to open your mind to those things and you want to say, I want to do more of this or less of that, and then the question becomes the hard one, when and how? <clears throat> and the action part is what mobilizes people. So they can see it, they can believe it, but they don't act on it. And your work <clears throat> is around galvanizing people, and in particularly in Rethink, which is your latest book. And by the way, it is superb. Please hold it up for us. So that there we go. Boring. And Rethink is so powerful because you're taking people through the steps of how do you go from stuck to unstuck? Yes. And how do you rethink what is possible for yourself? 
Well, let me tell you the origin of the book a little bit, because everything out of context is just a book. Um, but this has purpose on many levels. My husband and I set up the Simon Initiative for Entrepreneurship at Washington University in St. Louis. He's a serial entrepreneur. He had sold his business, and he and I wanted to make a contribution. I had been a visiting professor there. He's an alum. And at the program, we had a her summoned, helping entrepreneurs rise, and the women were all looking for role models. So I said, that's a good book. And I started to pull women together who I thought could be good role models. They didn't want to be Sheryl Sandberg, as well as she does and how good she is. But they really did want to have somebody who they could see. You know, there's a great quote. Marion Edelman said it, if I can't see it, I can't be it. Now, she was talking about African-American children, impoverished children, but this is for everybody mm. because we, we decide with the eyes. And if I can't see somebody who I want to be like, I don't know what it is. It's too scary. Mm. So the book came together. And about a year and a half ago, I was telling my husband the stories in them. And I, I interviewed 50 women and I was really understanding how they had been successful. And he said, you know, Andy, this is about smashing the myths of women in business. I say that slowly because I went, oh, my God, that's a much better book. And I went back and rewrote the book about how these women are smashing the myths. Every one of them, there are 11 women in there, each one of them in a different industry was told women don't do that. Evelyn Medvin is a geoscientist, brilliant woman, very successful. Uh, but women don't go into the field. What would they do? How would we care for them? And she became, of course, a very successful one. And then, you know, women don't lead. And Jamie Candy has led three companies to extraordinary success. And she, the businesses are? The business, one is the Admentum. One was my husband's quest story. And then she had one before then. But she leads differently. And what I'm anxious to help people understand is that it isn't women duplicating what the standard is that men have said. In fact, they're smashing the myths by rewriting the standard. And it's working. And so, you know, it doesn't matter who is in the, the book that you would find of value. It's written for you, the reader or the listener, because the whole idea is to give you somebody who you could say, well, if she can do it, I can too. Mm -hmm. Sam Rad or Sam Radokia is a wonderful story. She's a 30 under 30 IT whiz. She's had five companies, I think. But she's, she can code, but she can't, doesn't care about coding. She cares about applying IT to society. Mm -hmm. So she built one company around blockchain. She's got a new one coming out. She's full of the application. Well, women were the first computers way back when, and they really were named computers. And women have been very big in applying technology. So everyone's worried about why women don't stay in tech. Well, maybe that's not their role. Maybe their role is to take tech and apply it in ways that are creative and use all of that creative juice. So I'm excited. The book comes out January 5th, and it is already pre-selling extremely well on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Porchlight. But it's fun because my purpose is, yes, to get a book out, but more to help women rethink their own life's journeys. And that is going to be another program that we're going to develop that follows this because I think the time is right for women to just transform society. And, and you speak about five things that people can do to change the rules to get yes. into action. So let's, let's unpack those five things. And by the way, once again, the book is Rethink. It is available. And Andy, are people who are joining us now invited to the launch if they would like to come? And oh, yes. Women? Yes, of course. That would be wonderful. So how would they do that? Well, it's on January 6th at 7 p.m. And you will meet some of these extraordinary women. Yes. And you'll find a link on our website, andysimon.com, and you can register there. And it is, and, and you can, on that website, there's a way of contacting me if, in fact, you can't register for some reason. I've often learned that registration and tech sometimes get in the way of getting things done. Um, but andysimon.com, you'll find a free chapter of the book. You'll find a free chapter of my other book. And you'll also see some videos about why I wrote this book. But it is a time for us to share, like we're doing and to help others become the best they can be. So it's going to be an exciting, that evening is a party night. And I share that with you because come celebrate. I wanna to toast the women who are sharing their stories, share some of their stories. And then Maxine Clark, who was the real revolutionary who built a Build-A-Bear workshops, changing retail, 
you know, I'm not going to make it for you. Come and make it yourself. Everyone has a Build-A-Bear they love. She'll speak about the work she's doing. And Edie Fraser will be there. She's launched the Women's Business Collaborative to help women in business transform the whole position and power of women in business. And it's coming. You know, we have 37 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, the most ever. Oh, what's That's happening? Remarkable. So the good thing is andysimon.com if you want to join and you want to be part of that. And I assure you, I've been talking to Andy about it. It's going to be an extraordinary event. And so often, Andy, don't you think we hear something from someone else and the way it's phrased or the way you say it results in our shift. And that's what we're all looking for. We're all looking to say, how do we move forward in this difficult time? And you may hear something on the six that does that for you. But getting back to Andy Simon and five things that you can do right now, let's if we can, just very quickly, I don't want to give it all away because the book is a very worthwhile read, but just five things that you can do to accelerate where you're at. Or, you know, my favorite word is ramplify. Ramp it up and amplify it. <laughs> well, I love your words. But here's the simple things. We decide with the eyes and the heart. So if you see it or feel it, change it. You know, at this point in your own life, you have to step for a moment and see the person in the mirror. What do you see there? What do you see in your organization? What do you see in, in society? But if you see something, you have two choices. You can accept it or you can begin to think about how to change it. The second thing, don't let the rules rule you. Mm. Um, we fall back on the rules as if they are a comfortable way of avoiding accountability and taking responsibility. If you don't like the rules, change them. And nobody can change them better than you can. Margaret Mead had a quote similar to that, which is the only thing that people, the only way we change society is if people change it. And so you can. The third thing is smash the myths. We are storytellers. The secret of our success as human beings is the stories we've shared for millions of years. Now's the time for us to take those myths and change them. And the only way we can do that is to start to change the story. You know, whether it's Kamala Harris or it's Kim Ang, they are changing the story about what a woman can do. Now, how do we multiply, amplify? I like your, your, your mam, amplify. <laughs> we have to multiply. My neolithism, my neolithism, we, my but, ramplify. That's correct. And that's exactly the voice. You have a voice. When you're talking to your daughters, to your spouse, and the men are part of this because they too have to change and they have to enjoy the new collaboration. The third one is don't watch others struggle. Lend a hand. Mm -hmm. If you see someone who's having a difficult time in the office, you know, listen. And listening today is the most important thing you can do. You're not necessarily expected to have any wisdom. You haven't gone through this. But I will tell you that when you let somebody tell you about their story, the challenges they're facing, they begin to collaborate with their mind and you can help them imagine something. Ask them a lot of questions. Mm. Have you thought about, do you sound like, don't, don't, um, don't think you need to be their coach. Um, be a comforting listener who helps them. They can walk it through. They just need to talk to someone. And I think that the remote life we're in is the most mm, damaging to our mental health because we have no one to talk to. And so call a friend. How are you doing? You can wait till they ask you how you're doing. But the most important thing you can do is give a gift of listening it's not that hard. And man, does it go all so far. And the last one, you have the power if you feel it and use it. You have the power. If you can imagine a better world, your brain will begin to see it. And next thing you know, you will only see the things that conform to it. And you'll begin to delete the things that don't. But the brain needs familiarity. So the more you see it, the more you will feel like that's right. And whatever you do, say, oh, we've never done it that way. That is true but new things are happening. It's so exciting. So when you ask me in my poll where I am, um, there's nothing better for me as the vacuums. All my clients come with a vacuum. They're stuck or stalled personally or professionally. And, and what we do is help them see what's really often right in front of them. And because the brain shuts down and says, oh, that doesn't exist. And they say, why? And they say, ah, and of course. So it's a very exciting time. Don't waste the crisis. It's a great time to change. I love don't waste a crisis. I've always said, don't let good suffering go to waste. <laughs> I'm with you. I like, don't like, you know, it's so interesting. Um, Brene Brown had on her podcast, um, David Eagleman, 
and he's written a new book about the neuroplasticity of the brain. Yes. And he's even got a new term for it that's not even neuroplastic, but as adults, he says, don't underestimate how malleable your brain is. Because yes. we often think as adults that we are stuck, but actually we're far more capable of change than we thought ourselves to be. So neuroscience backs up everything you're saying. And, you know, it's inspiring just listening to you going, yes, we are able. And I think this period of time, right, Andy, this COVID uncertainty has been a very interesting time because it's galvanized you. Yes. Certainly has galvanized me, not that I haven't had my ups and downs and periods of insecurity, but for some it has been completely sabotaging, annihilating. And so your work becomes all the more important. What companies, when we look at now, are doing such a good job at doing what you're saying? I mean, I think about DoorDash or the companies, when I look at, you know, Bloomberg News, the companies that are really, I mean, Zoom itself, we're on StreamYard right now. You well, know, yes. they're constantly growing, adapting. Um, for my women's business collaborative work, some of the panelists have been talking about what they're doing. Deloitte, for example, did a marvelous study of all of their employees to see how they could focus and help them. And what they found was the two things was their emotional well-being right, and belonging. So listening became part of what they were doing, and now they were figuring out how do we build a culture where people can have the two are connected? Because the most important thing for people, even more than food and, and shelter, is belonging. Mm -hmm. There's other neuro research, but there's some really good stuff. So that was very interesting. Target has really put a huge emphasis on how do we sustain a retail business at a time when it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the vice chair of MasterCard was talking about what they're doing at a time like this to help women in business stay in business and how to begin to help them work with the banks and so forth. I do think that there are some like banks who haven't figured out that their role now isn't to hurt people. I, mean, I have one client going through a mess. Her entire business was wiped out with COVID. So she had a six and a half million dollar business that is now gone. And the banks haven't been nice. Mm. And, and instead of being enabling to help her come back out of it, um, they've been banks. And I was a banker for 15 years, 14 years, and they can be unpleasant. Um, but I also know that banks are primarily run by men. So I have another bias there, which is that if they had a few more women, they might have figured out how to help women go through this in a different fashion. Uh, and those are so excited of them. Yes. <laughs> But but there's there's a time now for I think everyone my healthcare client has been a particularly great illustration of this. I'm working with Appalachian Regional Health in Kentucky. They're a multi hospital system, and they went on on they all went quarantined and they had a furlough. But they are working really hard at recovering, but also caring for their employees, beginning to build relationships in those communities. It's a very complicated world for health and healthcare. Uh, and and it's a uh, it's it's real interesting to watch how their conversations have shifted, and the command and control has become more and more uh, collaborative and empowering. And I'm watching them work with their staff to understand how they can all add value differently, innovatively, and importantly. Because isn't that what every company needs to do right now? Is the level of agility that you need to survive has got to be so great. And are you really incorporating that into the culture? You spoke about the Women's Collaborative, and this is something, again, anybody who is watching, listening, men too. You know, men forget that if they are part of women's groups, it's excellent networking. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, Jeff Holter, who was formerly at Coca-Cola, and he now is a diversity strategist and deals with women's empowerment. And Jeff always used to say, you know, he was one of the only men who ever joined the women's groups and, <laughs> and it gave him great insights. So Jeff, thank you for being that. But tell us more about the Women's Collaborative and what's in it for people to join. And again, Andy, what's really helpful is you let us know where we can do this. So Nadia, the Women's Business Collaborative was formed by Edie Fraser. 
a woman who has a vision of how we can actually make a difference in, and we'll stay just in business. We don't have to work about politics or sports or anything else, society. But business has an enormous impact if we can change the dynamics of women in there. How can we get more women on the boards, more women in the P&L functions of the C-suites, not just the chief human resource officers? How can we begin to fill the pipeline? How, how can we turn the diversity initiative into something that actually happens? Because what we're learning is that recruiters bring in a diverse pool, mm -hmm. but the hiring people don't hire them. All kinds of interesting things. Mm -hmm. So what she's assembled are 40 some odd uh, organizations who are each in the past doing their own thing um, and are now coming together to try and figure out how the collaboration can accelerate, amplify the work that each is doing. We have an advisory council. We're up to 130 members. Now, this is a one year and a half old, actually, it's a one year organization. So we are mobilizing people who want to come in and bring their passion and purpose and focus and fun together so we can actually do better together. We're going to move faster forward. And then there's a leadership council. So there are different ways of both belonging. And part of the whole purpose here is we have nine initiatives. The question is, which one do you wish to participate in? How do we improve the staffing? How do we improve the training and development? What are we going to do to really help the venture capitalists understand women? You know, venture capital money, only 3% of it goes to women businesses. Mm. How can an entrepreneur survive, much less thrive? And it's beginning to shift very little. But now how do we change the pitch? So entrepreneurs know how to pitch to often the male venture capitalists? How do we get women together to do it? How do we change the position and the power? So if you're interested, it's Women's Business Collaborative. I think the, the, the URL is wbcollaborative.org. And the, the nature, you can take a look at the nine initiatives, the people who are in there. Part of this is networking. Part of this is women helping women. And I must tell you that I've met more amazing sharing women than I could have imagined. Mm. They all want to help each other. And we're all trying to figure out how to help our larger society become mm. the best it can be. So it's a great initiative coming. It's a movement. And that's what I think is so powerful. And of course, andysimon.com if people want to reach you or find out more. And if so, it's Women's Business it's Collaborative. Collaborative. Yes. Women's Business Collaborative.org. Yes. Good. So womensbusinesscollaborative.org, andysimon.com. Andy, you know, we're nearing the end of 2020, which has been an annus horribilis for a lot of people, right? <laughs> um, for you and I, we've seen opportunities, but it's been a very difficult year for a lot of people, and it's a scary year. You know, the true definition of VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous year. It so, is. Andy Simon's end of year, new year inspiration for all of us to move forward with the knowledge you have, the anthropological knowledge and the knowledge of dealing with change. Well, I keep in front of me uh, something that goes like this, imagine it and create it. I don't want to get more complicated, but I think that if you can collaborate with your mind and manage what you see coming, next year can be a great year for you. But the only one who can do that for you is you. And so now is the time to begin to think about how to rethink your life's journey and make it the best that you can be. The only thing you have to do is imagine it. If you see it, you believe it, and you act on it, act on it, act on it, then next thing you know, the year is going to be a very exciting one. And you're going to say, this was easy. Entrepreneurs often get the word, nobody will do that. No, you can't. No, it won't work. And then they do it. And it was obvious. To some degree, we're all entrepreneurs today. And so as you think about the future, remember, we're a futurist. I'm a futurist. We live today based on what we imagine tomorrow's going to be. The thing that you said about as being so uncertain, the Volca, is that the lack of certainty scares us. We need certainty. Make it up. People say, well, I don't know what's going to be. You never did. But if you plan on something, you'll get there. And if it's not right, you can address it along the way. But to stop thinking that it's uncertain. Life is uncertain. We don't know from one day to the next. So wake up in the morning and say, this is a gift. How do I make it better? Imagine it and it will happen. I hope that answers because I am inspired. Andy, 
I am going to make sure that I um, transcribe this interview. So I'm going to send it out as a newsletter as well as a transcription. And it is available if you want to rewatch it, because you probably do on YouTube. And it's andysimon.com. And hold up the book once more. Here we and go. Thank you so much for taking us off the brink, actually, and <laughs> helping us rethink today. I'm Nadia Bilchik. And my website is nadiaspeaks.com. And if you want to reach Andy, andysimon.com. And thank you for joining us for just a wonderful, insightful conversation. Andy Simon, thank you. Thank you, Nadia. It's been a pleasure.